So the title of my talk is uh, Private Debt Booms and the Real Economy, Do the Benefits Outweigh uh, the Costs? So this is sort of going to be focused more on the macroeconomic implications uh, of credit booms. And not to leave you in suspense, uh, the short of my take is probably not. But I do say probably <laughs> because it requires quite a bit of, of humility to kind of answer this question, um, both because I'm not going to be taking uh, you know, a, a stance on the welfare implications of credit booms, which are very, very difficult uh, to do. And also because even from a statistical perspective, uh, this, is a, this is a hard question to answer. But I am going to argue that from a, just a macroeconomic perspective in terms of uh, you know, income per capita, real GDP, credit booms don't really seem uh, to be worth it in the sense that the uh, benefits don't seem to outweigh uh, the costs. Okay, so let me define what is uh, a, a credit boom or what is a private debt boom. Well, I'm just going to think of it as an episode of a rapid expansion in credit originated to households uh, and non-financial uh, firms. And we're, we're really interested in private debt booms because they've been playing an increasingly prominent role uh, in economic fluctuations and business cycles, uh, at least in the post-war era, uh, especially since the late 1970s. Credit booms have, have kind of been mattering uh, more and more uh, for booms and recessions. The way I think about it from a really broad perspective is there's two ways to think about private credit uh, or private debt in the economy and about credit booms specifically. One perspective is kind of the, the more traditional perspective, at least before the crisis, which is the, the idea of credit deepening. That is that there's a uh, credit boom could represent a period of structural improvement uh, in the financial sector's ability to intermediate credit uh, to households and especially to firms. That leads to more uh, investment. That should be good, right? And that's sort of, if you basically read a lot of the literature uh, up until 2007, that was most of sort of the finance and macro uh, discussion was, was about credit deepening. In recent years, we've you know, become much more attuned again to the costs of credit booms, which I'll summarize sort of with the term financial fragility, this idea that credit booms uh, lead to builds up in risk and vul vulnerabilities that end up sowing the seeds of economic destruction uh, in different ways that I'll, that I'll be more, uh, more specific about. So the basic uh, question in some sense about credit booms is whether the benefits, uh, oh, this is cool, from the perspective of, uh, of, of credit deepening, outweigh the costs uh, from the, uh, uh, that come from financial uh, fragility. So what am I going to do in this paper? I'm essentially going to revisit uh, the connection between uh, private debt booms and the real economy. That's been the subject of a lot of research by many people uh, in, this, in this room. Uh, and looking at the evidence in a number of different ways, both just what are the consequences of credit booms uh, for, for, for growth, and also how do cre credit booms actually affect, affect the real economy. So what are the mechanisms uh, that we should be thinking about uh, for how credit affects the real economy? And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to be using new uh, panel data, uh, not put together by myself, but put together by a, a lot of hard work by people at the BIS and, and the IMF, covering about 140 countries over the past six uh, decades uh, or, or so. So the coverage depends a little bit uh, from country uh, to country. And along the way, I'll, I'll talk about how this connects uh, to all of, the, uh, all of the fantastic work that's been done by many people in, in this room. So the key message, number one, is we really have to think about credit booms and credit deepening as fundamentally different, uh, different economic mechanisms. They operate in very different, uh, different ways. And I think this provides some bridge between the literature uh, on kind of finance and growth uh, and the literature on credit booms and financial, uh, financial crises. So in the data, long run growth does go hand in hand with credit deepening. I think this is actually very important uh, to, uh, to, to remember. Uh, credit is a kind of a good barometer for the level of, of development, both within countries uh, over time and just ac across countries in levels. And you hear this if you talk to policymakers, uh, central bankers, especially in emerging markets, the level of credit is something that they monitor as essentially a good sign uh, of, of the economy. However, in contrast to sort of this more gradual credit deepening, debt booms are actually associated with short-run economic booms, followed by predictable, and, and, and the predictability here is reasonably strong, economic slowdowns uh, in terms of real GDP in, in, in the medium run. And one of the things that you see in the data, especially in such a large sample, is that I think there's reasonable evidence that they also not only lead to slower growth in the medium run, but actually to a, a, a lower 
long run level of output. And this is, I think, a more controversial statement, so let me just be, uh, be clear uh, about that. And the reason why credit booms and credit deepening are sort of different, and we have to think about them differently, is that they affect the economy through fundamentally uh, different, uh, different channels. So debt booms, uh, there's lots of evidence, I'll show you, distort the economy essentially by boosting demand in the economy instead of produ productive capacity and by fueling unproductive things uh, like real estate uh, boom, booms. That turns out to be a systematic pattern uh, in the data. And once the booms end, they, le they leave a lot of uh, problems and trouble uh, for, uh, for the economy uh, and for regulators, so banking sector distress, debt overhang in the private sector, and also for small open economies, they leave an overvalued a real, real exchange rate. And this is both small open economies outside of the US, but also within the, U the US, across US states, you see that areas that have the biggest credit booms actually end up losing uh, competitiveness. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit about this idea of credit deepening, because it is in some sense an idea that's been forgotten uh, a little bit in the past few years, I, uh, I think at least in terms of the emphasis in the research. So there's a large literature that argues just that a better functioning financial system contributes to and facilitates uh, stronger economic growth. Kind of, you know, perhaps the, the, the seminal uh, kind of summary of this is this handbook chapter by, by Ross Levine. Uh, and this, uh, this sort of research generally argues uh, that uh, credit deepening improves the economy through some sort of productive capacity channel, typically. So a better functioning financial system lowers the cost of credit for firms to invest it increases access to, 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 uh, uh, to credit for constrained uh, firms. It maybe leads to a better allocation of credit across uh, firms, so less misallocation uh, across firms, and lots of other different uh, channels that are good. So in this literature, credit depth measures uh, are uh, typically used to, to, to proxy for financial uh, development. So a way to think about it is, well, private debt booms, they might just be periods of accelerating uh, credit deep. So here's the, the evidence on credit deepening. Uh, this is just a very basic data on the level of private debt to GDP in 2015 and log real GDP per capita in 2015 uh, as well. And I call this the, the income debt curve, but there's probably a, you could probably come up with a better name. But it's actually kind of a pretty you know, strong positive relationship in, in, in levels. So there's you know, structural differences across countries you might want to worry about. But you know, it's strongly positive. Uh, and uh, to some extent, uh, concave, so maybe suggests uh, that you know, not, it's not as positive uh, for uh, more, developed, uh, more developed economies. Um, but uh, you tend to see that you know, countries that have uh, more developed financial systems tend to have higher income per capita. A lot of this is obviously running from you know, just financial development uh, to credit to GDP, but maybe you know, that's at least what this uh, uh, financing growth literature argues. Maybe there's some uh, you know, causal effect from uh, credit uh, to a higher level of, of income. So this turns out, so this is just a level across countries. If you look uh, in the cross section of countries over time, uh, what you see is also that countries that grow more over time uh, in terms of real GDP also have uh, more rapid uh, uh, increases in credit uh, to GDP, but the relationship is not nearly as strong uh, as, as in levels. So this is just sort of a long run change over uh, over 40 years. So it does suggest that sort of long run economic growth does go hand in hand uh, with, uh, with, with credit uh, deepening. Um, and, that, uh, and, and that might be partly because of you know, the, the influence of better functioning uh, financial markets um, that you know, uh, allow firms to access, uh, access credit. Okay, so now let me kind of zoom in uh, with that backdrop and talk a little bit more about private, uh, private debt growth. So the question is really, are private debt booms just periods of accelerating uh, credit deepening? Interestingly, I don't think many people in this room would think that, but if you go present in a typical macro seminar and you show that credit booms predict lower growth, they would say that's impossible. Permanent income hypothesis or some other type, type of logic, uh, you know, credit should follow good things, you know, in part because people uh, should have the right beliefs and, and so on uh, and, and so forth. Um, so what I'm going to do to kind of uh, uh, try to answer this question is just use a very, very simple uh, approach that's uh, inspired by work by Victor Schulrich uh, and Wachtel, which is just to try to identify a bunch of credit boom uh, events. So here I'm going to identify 190 credit boom events for 130 
three countries going back uh, to around 1960. But all of the results I'm going to show are really robust to using more traditional VAR or sort of, uh, you know, Jordan local projection uh, type methodology uh, as well. But I think this is just kind of a very simple way to show uh, the results. So this is how I identify a credit boom, uh, just to use the U.S. as an example. What you see here uh, is just the level of private debt to uh, GDP uh, in the United States going back to 1960. What I do is I use this uh, filtering uh, procedure. It's called the Hamilton filter, but you can think of it like an HP filter or just some kind of methodology that tries to extract uh, some sort of long-term uh, trend. So it turns out the Hamilton filter, which is uh, uh, based on a paper by James Ham Hamilton called Why You Should Never Use the HP Filter. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I kind of thought I should use the Hamilton filter. Uh, it turns out it's a little bit kind of more wiggly up and down, but it does kind of uh, do the job of, of detrending. So if you take the difference between these two figures, what you get is this Hamilton filtered private debt to GDP ratio for the United States. And it sort of makes sense. We had two major credit booms since 1960 in the US. We had the 1980s a credit boom, which was kind of uh, somewhat more uh, moderate, and then we obviously uh, have the 2000s. Okay, then to actually identify a credit boom event, you need to do something very arbitrary. You need to speci specify some threshold. So I'm going to uh, specify a threshold. Uh, that is, uh, every time uh, basically this Hamilton filter debt to GDP exceeds 1.64 times standard, uh, standard deviation, right? So, so whenever kind of this uh, Hamilton filter debt to GDP is above some value. And you can sort of vary this value and think about robustness. So what this implies for the U.S. is that there's one debt uh, boom uh, in, since 1960, which, which starts in 2005. And then a debt boom is just identified uh, as being in the first year uh, of, uh, uh, of whenever this series crosses this threshold. Okay, so then let's just ask, using this very simple approach, what are the dynamics of you know, real GDP uh, around these uh, debt boom uh, events? So I'm going to look at uh, real GDP growth from five years before, and then you know, as far out as, as essentially I, I want to go. So I'll go uh, ten, ten, 10 years out. So basically, the dating of the private debt boom is in, in time zero. So this would be like 2005 for the US boom. So I'm going to start in 2000, and then I'm basically just going to ask, OK, what happens to the predicted path of real GDP. So if I knew how to make a GIF and put it into a, a presentation, that's what I would do. But this is going to be kind of the more simple version. So this is what happens. So basically, real GDP goes up, up until the dating of the debt boom. So so far, it sort of you know looks like things are going reasonably well. But then what happens is after the debt boom uh, is dated, you see a drop uh, in real GDP. And basically, the drop essentially continues um, for you know, 10 years out. So this is consistent with kind of this evidence that shows that these debt booms tend to predict, you know, at least in, in sample and to some, ex some extent out of sample, slower growth uh, in, in the medium run. That, I think, has been kind of established in a number, uh, a number of different papers. Um, the more controversial <coughs> claim here is that there's even some level, that, uh, some evidence that the long run level of output is actually lower than the previous trend. Let me get back to that point uh, and, and make sure that I, I appropriately caveat. OK, so I think actually this evidence is not, in some sense, too surprising if you connect the dots between existing research that's already been done. So for example, Shulrich and Taylor uh, and others show that debt booms predict financial crises. There's an older paper by Sarah and Saxena in the AER that shows that financial crises actually leave permanent output gaps. So actually, output basically falls. And then you're always below trend, so you're never going to catch up. OK, that doesn't necessarily mean that debt booms are going to lead to a lower long run level of output, because it could be that the debt booms that don't lead to crises actually end up leading to very strong growth. But uh, in work that I've done with Atik Mian and Amr Sufi, we found that debt booms, and especially household debt booms, but debt booms in general, predict growth slowdowns more generally. So there's, there, you know, this predictability for financial crises isn't offset by some predictability sort of uh, in, uh, in good times. OK, so that's how it connects with the existing evidence. Let me just mention a couple of caveats. So one, the long run effect is really quite difficult uh, to estimate for a very simple statistical reason, that if you're increasing the forecast horizon, uh, just the uncertainty uh, increases with, uh, with the horizon. The second caveat is kind of one of, of causality. So I've essentially just taken these debt boom events 
and sort of argued, well, let's just look at what happens to GDP and sometimes you know, use the word association and maybe sometimes use the word that sounds more like causality. Uh, so there's, of course, this, this issue that debt booms aren't actually just these exogenous events. Uh, they could be caused by sort of some more fundamental economic factors. But that being said, if you think about it, most of the, most of the kind of uh, typical models that you would write down would argue that debt booms should actually follow good economic developments or good, good economic uh, conditions. So it sort of at least does raise some important questions about debt booms, why debt booms tend to be associated with lower growth and maybe a lower long run level of, of output. So my conclusion is really that the hypothesis that debt booms are associated with some beneficial credit deepening seems to be quite strongly rejected uh, by the data. So debt booms, uh, so sorry, credit deepening is, a, is potentially associated uh, with, with higher levels of income, but debt booms are just not the way that you're gonna get that credit deepening. Debt booms uh, are fundamentally, fundamentally different. Um, you know, these results are, 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 are kind of reasonably robust. You know, if you go back, uh, look, looking at a longer uh, event window uh, around these episodes, so kind of going 10 years back uh, and 15 years forward, you know, you can look at other types of specifications like not actually doing any of this identification of these debt booms and just looking, let's look at three year changes in debt to GDP and how they correlate with kind of uh, GDP growth around these, these periods. And you tend to see sort of uh, similar patterns. You know, you can run kind of local projection type impulse responses and you find similar patterns. Actually, the local projections don't even give you much of a boom uh, in the short run. And, and we can talk a little bit about uh, what, why that happens if we have time. Okay. So let me talk now a little bit about uh, this question of, you know, why are debt booms associated with lower future outputs? So I'm going to kind of try to dig into uh, the mechanisms a little bit more and tell a little bit of a story about sort of the typical debt boom uh, in this post-war uh, post sample. Uh, and I think some of the mechanisms or the, or the, or the story I'm going to tell is going to help reinforce, uh, at least to some extent, this idea that debt booms are actually uh, causing lower output, lower growth, uh, not just sort of associated with some other economic, uh, economic mechanism. Okay, so the first, uh, the first uh, fact really is that debt booms are uh, seem to be associated with or maybe driven by credit supply expansions. Earlier we were having a discussion about whether a credit cycle was just a credit supply cycle uh, or not. And here's sort of evidence uh, that these debt booms uh, tend to be credit supply driven. So you have private debt to GDP uh, here detrended just around these debt boom events. So now I'm going back and using these debt boom uh, events. And here you have measures of credit spreads, which you see tend to be low uh, during the debt booms, and then they spike at the end of, of, of the boom. So this is kind of very consistent uh, with work, for, for example, by uh, Arvind Krishnamurthy and Tyler Muir, who presented earlier that credit spreads tend to be low uh, kind of before, during debt booms, and then they spike uh, after, afterward. So credit supply expansion, that seems to be kind of the main story uh, for, 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 the, for these debt booms. Credit supply expansion can be driven by lots of different things. It could be about uh, beliefs. Uh, it could be about financial liberalization. Uh, it could be about uh, global liquidity. I think that's very important for lots of small open uh, economies, just the cost of borrowing in international markets. And when those costs change, that leads to an increase uh, in, in, in the availability of credit. Okay, so basically the fact that credit booms are associated with an expansion in credit supply already tells you, explains why credit isn't just following, for example, faster productivity growth. So there's something that's actually changing in the financial sector that's leading financial intermediaries to be willing uh, to lend uh, more. So when you have this credit supply expansion, it can basically operate yeah, in two ways. One, it can boost product, productive capacity. Or two, it can boost, uh, it can fuel uh, demand. And in a recent paper with Atif Mian uh, and Amr Sufi, we kind of write down a very simple open economy model that, that lets you disentangle the role of these different uh, factors. So in particular, if the credit expansion is operating through a demand channel, what you should tend to see is an expansion in the non-traded sector relative to the traded sector. And what you should also see is an appreciation of the real exchange rate. And for open economies where you have, or for countries where you have the data, you should also see uh, ri rising, uh, rising imports um, as, as well. And the logic is very simple. If you have an expansion in credit supply that increases demand, for example, by households, 
that leads to an increase in, for example, consumption demand. If you consume tradables and non-tradables, well, you can import more tradables, but you have to actually produce the non-tradables locally. So that leads to a big reallocation toward non-tradables. But non-tradables are going to be relatively scarce. So that increases the price of non-tradables. The price of non-tradables goes up. That's effectively a real exchange rate uh, appreciation. So that's, that should be happening if the demand channel uh, is operating. If the uh, productive capacity channel is operative, in most models, you tend to see limited uh, reallocation between the tradable and non-tradable sector, even if the credit expansion is affecting these two sectors uh, differently. And what you also should tend to see is rising, uh, rising exports. Okay. So what do the data say, again, for these uh, debt boom events across uh, countries? Well, what you tend to see is an expansion in non-tradable relative to tradable employment during the boom, followed by a sharp reversal uh, after, after the debt boom. The same is true for non-tradable relative uh, to tradable output. So this is evidence that these debt booms seem to be affecting the sectoral composition in the economy, kind of a little bit connected to what Karsten uh, was saying earlier earlier today using sectoral credit data. Uh, so they seem to be kind of leading to this reallocation toward non-tradable sectors like construction, but also, uh, also for example, wholesale and retail trade. At the same time, they lead to real exchange rate uh, appreciation as well, as well. So this is the real effective uh, exchange rate from the BIS. You can also think about real exchange rates as the relative price of non-tradables. And these debt booms are associated with, with real appreciation uh, in, in, in both of these measures. That means that it makes it more difficult for the tradable sector also uh, to compete. So that's sort of another consequence of these debt booms. Uh, on the, on the uh, imports and exports and net exports margin, you see imports are rising kind of relative to their trend and then collapse after the debt boom. In contrast, exports are actually a little bit above trend, but kind of actually seem to be dwindling and fall a little bit less. So that means that actually during these debt booms, these economies are importing lots more goods and running, kind of increasing their current account uh, 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 trade and current account uh, deficits, so also borrowing more externally in order to finance, uh, finance these, uh, these imports. That provides, I think, further evidence for the role of these kind of, this kind of demand channel uh, in, in, in uh, kind of how the uh, debt booms propagate to, uh, to the real economy. Okay, so then you kind of you have this demand boom, and then at some point, we sort of know from the data that the credit supply expansion tends to reverse. So there's some kind of uh, mean reversion uh, in uh, credit market sentiment. Um, and I think one of the things, and, and, and you're on in the, in the, in, uh, the previous uh, paper uh, by Alessia and Casper was sort of getting a little bit at this, what actually precipitates the reversal? I think this is one of the things that's much less uh, well understood. It's definitely less well understood uh, by professional forecasters because they usually don't predict the reversal. So uh, that's, um, uh, but I think we also don't understand the reversal that well either. Um, and at the same time, uh, so one, sorry, one kind of potential hypothesis is sort of this more behavioral story uh, of kind of a sequence of bad shocks that leads to a shift uh, from optimism to pessimism that shifts credit market sentiment and credit markets become much, uh, much, uh, much tighter. Some evidence for this, you know, including work we've done with, with Matt uh, and Wei uh, that Matt talked about yesterday, is that bank equity returns seem to suggest that relatively early uh, in crises and kind of after credit booms, um, losses tend to be realized uh, by bank equity uh, investors, suggesting that maybe there's a gradual realization that many of the loans that were made during these debt booms weren't actually uh, as profitable uh, as expected. So this year is bank equity returns during these debt boom events. So they're, they're kind of soaring, but then they peak uh, a year or two before, and then they really fall. And there's essentially a permanent decline uh, in, in, in the value, uh, market value uh, of bank equity around these, these episodes. And it happens a little bit before uh, when, the, when the overall credit cycle bursts. In contrast, non-financial equities uh, seem to keep rising until uh, about the peak of the debt boom, and then they fall and recover uh, somewhat. Again, another kind of interesting asymmetry between bank equity and non-financial equity is kind of the, the more medium-run implications. That for banks, the, the losses seem to be permanent, so sort of like a cash flow effect that the end of these booms tend to be bad for banks, whereas for, not, for non-financials, the losses are more temporary, suggesting that you know, risk premium are relatively uh, ele elevated during these, uh, during these periods. And of course, you also see uh, these dynamics for, for house prices. 
kind of housing booms and busts are really a, a central feature of lots of these debt booms, especially the most destructive ones, <coughs> as for example, the, the, the paper uh, by Moritz and his co-authors show that actually one of the best variables for diagnosing whether a, a, a debt boom is bad is actually the, the growth of, of house prices. Okay, so what are the factors behind uh, the, uh, the growth slowdown? I've already talked about credit supply reversal that sort of triggers it. You know, the other factor is just all the debt that, you know, all the debt overhang, all the debt that you built up during the boom uh, under a certain level of expectations, that has to be paid back. And so, for example, a really nice, uh, uh, really nice paper uh, by Anton Kornick uh, and his co-author shows that the GDP declines after debt booms coincide exactly when the net flow uh, of funds reverses from lenders to borrowers. So basically when borrowers have to start repaying, uh, when, 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 when lenders stop lending and when borrowers have to start uh, repaying. We kind of looked at this, so with, with uh, my co-author, Gilza Gignosi, we looked at this during a very kind of extreme episode, uh, which was this foreign currency debt crisis in Hungary, where essentially households uh, had to you know, repay after the debt boom, uh, but they had to repay about 60 to 70% more uh, than they expected because most of the loans were denominated in Swiss francs and there was a large appreciation uh, of the Swiss franc during, uh, uh, during the financial crisis. And we see that this, of course, uh, leads to a large rise in defaults, a big collapse in consumption, and also a very severe local recession in, in areas uh, that have more of these Swiss franc uh, loans. So sort of debt overhang itself seems to be an important uh, important central uh, mechanism. You know, the decline in house prices and, and, and other asset values like, you know, Atatmian and Amr Sufi have showed, as well as many others, that uh, kind of precipitates a worse, uh, worse recession uh, as well and sort of reinforces the decline uh, in, in demand. And then what you really need, uh, you know, based on most models and also the evidence that we have, what you really need for the decline in demand to translate into a decline in output is you need some notion of downward nominal rigidity, for example, downward nominal uh, rate wage rigidity that actually translates those declines in, de in demand into declines uh, in output, like, for example, the model uh, by Schmidt, Rohe, and Uribe. One of the interesting things about downward nominal wage, wage rigidity, or just nominal rigidity in general, is that they can also imply kind of more long-term uh, effects. So when you have these debt booms, you have periods where you kind of uh, you see there's kind of overvaluation, so real exchange rates appreciate. And then if it's hard for wages to actually fall, then you can have kind of more long-term effects as the tradable sector loses com uh, competitiveness. And this can sort of lead to persistent mi misallocation uh, and, and kind of a loss of market share amongst the tradable sector. That can maybe explain part of the reason why these debt booms not only lead to growth slowdowns, but actually a lower long-run uh, level uh, of, of output. Okay. So I think I'm, I'm close to being out of time. So let me just kind of provide uh, a few final final thoughts. Some of these are uh, correlated with, with, with Karsten's uh, thoughts as well. So what do we actually do about these, uh, these debt booms? Uh, so, you know, macro prudential policy uh, has, has kind of received a lot of attention. And I think the macro prudential policies do have a role in kind of limit, limiting the most excessive, the most uh, extreme debt booms. But I think we also have to be aware of the fact that they can't be expected to avoid all crises, and they have a few practical, uh, practical challenges. So the first one uh, is unintended consequences, and we've talked about uh, these unintended consequences in a number of different ways throughout uh, this, uh, this conference. So part of it is the migration problem. So you regulate one sector, uh, that leads to migration uh, to, to other sectors. Um, you also have unintended consequences, even if you do uh, regulation, for example, uh, at, the, at, the, at the sector level or the product level, that it leads banks to lend more uh, to riskier borrowers in other sectors. So that we have direct evidence from, uh, from Ireland, for example. Two, you know, there's this time inconsistency issue, political cycle. So Karsten uh, Muller has a nice paper uh, showing that you know uh, these macro prudential policies are subject uh, to uh, to political pressure potentially. And the third one, which I think is actually kind of the most fundamental challenge is in some sense, how do we really know when the macro prudential policy actually worked? So for monetary policy, you know, we have an observable 2% target uh, for inflation. We can sort of observe whether we're at, uh, wh whether we're at the target overshooting uh, or undershooting. We have a full employment uh, target as well. That's perhaps a little bit harder to actually evaluate, but still we can sort of uh, 
uh, we can take data to it. For macro prudential policy, what, what is kind of the, the, the criterion? Is it that we should have uh, no crises uh, at all? Is it that the crises should be less severe? Less severe relative to, to what? Um, I think that's where conferences like these, all the research that's being done just in terms of understanding how these credit cycles work uh, and, and sort of how they influence the economy uh, is very important precisely because it gives us a better sense of how these policies uh, would have worked. And I think, you know, there probably is sort of the Stigler uh, rule. So George Stigler had this rule for flying, uh, that if you're not, if you don't miss a few flights, you're probably spending too much time in airports. So if you don't have a few crises, maybe we're kind of over-regulating uh, over uh, some part of the financial uh, system. And I think that is just something that we have to be uh, aware of kind of as we think about uh, formulating all, all of these uh, policies. So yeah, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. And um, thank you very much for having me discuss the paper. Um, as expected, it's, it's a very insightful paper, um, thought-provoking, and I just have a few um, thoughts on this. So Emil's thesis is, is squarely um, based on, on, on these pictures, which Emil um, explained. So these pictures show that following um, a debt boom or credit boom, which is a rapid short-run expansion in private credit to GDP, um, real GDP first increases, then decreases, but the focus is on the long run effects, where in the long run, it may end up at a lower level than where it initially started. So, and, 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 and this basically gives rise to, to Emil's conclusion that, you know, the idea that debt booms are part of beneficial credit deepening is soundly rejected by the data because it looks like in the end, we're ending up at a lower level of GDP where we started. So these debt booms must be ultimately bad um, in, in real terms. Now, um, before I talk about this, let me just quickly point out one, one thing. This result and these pictures are also um, obtained in, in Emil's paper with um, Amir and Atif, uh, which focuses more on, on the role of household debt. So you have the same impulse responses, which show uh, cycles, and ultimately we're ending at a lower level than where we started. In, in that paper, they, they quickly mention that but they don't emphasize it for two reasons. One is, as Emil pointed out, the standard errors become very large as you increase the forecast horizon. Another one, however, is they also notice that um, the lower long run level of GDP after the positive shock is not robust um, after excluding the Great Recession. That was in the case of the, the Joda local projections where you notice that. So one thing, this, uh, what you did in the QGE paper, you looked at household debt and here you look at overall private credit to GDP, but it may be worthwhile checking whether or not this is robust to include in the Great Recession or, or not. It's, it's just a small remark. So um, the main question I have is, what is the counterfactual here? In, in all of these uh, pictures that we've seen, uh, the results are obtained based on comparing GDP relative to some trend or to some um, country level average because you use fixed effects in these regressions. And, and the question is, is that the right counterfactual? If we did not have this debt boom, would we be worse off? Uh, would we be better off? Would it be a GDP trend or country level average? Or maybe is the counterfactual a different growth path altogether? And uh, this may um, sound um, not intuitive uh, because we, we always think that when we end up at a lower level of GDP relative to trend, that must be bad. But there is a theory out there that would argue that these credit booms are inseparable from the beneficial effects of credit deepening. And ultimately, that there is a genuine trade-off between a long-run real GDP growth and crisis risk. So there are effectively two types of growth path. One is a risky growth path, which has high GDP average long-run growth, but also uh, credit booms and crisis risk. And then there's a safe growth path, which has no credit booms, but lower long-run GDP growth. And according to this theory, which I will explain um, in a little bit, the um, choosing a growth path, a safer growth path, without these debt booms would be like throwing out the baby with the bathwater, because we would not have the debt booms, but we would be worse off because we have a lower long-run average growth. Now, the other um, view of the world, which I think Emil would more subscribe to, is um, that these credit booms are in principle, separable from the beneficial effects of credit deepening. And you know, policy can do something about them, to some extent at least. Um, whether or not we can avoid them, but at least they can be curbed, their impact can be softened. And, and in this case, I believe um, 
the, the right discussion has to be about what can we do about it. Emil mentioned it a little bit in the end of his presentation, but I want to talk a little bit more about that. How can we identify these the credit booms in real time? And what are the policy tools available? I will talk about this in the context of a study that has not been mentioned so far in these two days. Um, it's a study by IMF researchers um, based on 170 countries. Good. So um, when we look at the United States, uh, 2004 uh, to 2009, and here you have private debt to GDP, and the green line is real GDP per capita, <coughs> this kind of looks like the impulse responses that we've seen from, uh, from Emil's presentation. And, and, and if you look very carefully, we're ending up with a lower level of GDP than, than we started. And, and so this is like the, the adverse long run effect. Now, when we take a bigger perspective and we zoom out, we see that um, th this is like what we have on the left side here. We see that in the long run, there's a very positive correlation between private debt to GDP and real GDP per capita in the US. And this alternative view of the world, this, let's call it the trade-off theory, would say, well, maybe the counterfactual of not having this little wiggle would be having a lower long-run growth path. So we can't really not have this wiggle here. I mean, I'm calling the Great Recession a wiggle. Uh, <laughs> so we can't not have this wiggle here and, and assume we would have continued along some trend in the absence of it. But the alternative would have been a much lower, lower growth path altogether. And um, this view comes from a, a very influential paper by uh, Rossian, Tornell, and Westerman in the QJE. And, and their motivating pictures are uh, Thailand and India. I'm not sure if you can see this at the end. Um, this is India. The solid line and the dashed line is Thailand. And here you have real credit, and here you have GDP per capita. And ultimately, India, which is the solid line here, has a very a slow but very steady growth, past 140, 14% GDP growth. Thailand, on the other hand, has a very high growth, but they also have lending booms and busts, and they have um, associated crisis. But the, um, the bottom line of this picture is despite the lending boom and bust, Thailand has a higher long run GDP than India. And so uh, the argument is that obviously the authors <laughs> do not want to say that you know, financial crises are good for growth, but what they want to say is that you know, high growth paths are associated with the undertaking of systemic risk and with the occurrence of occasional crisis. The cost of a high growth path is this, this, this crisis risk. And uh, the theory behind this is it's, it's, it's kind of a, a nice theory. It's based on imperfect enforceability of contracts, which lead to borrowing constraints. And in their theory model, there's an implicit bailout guarantee, which then leads agents in the economy to take risks systemically. And this leads to investment and lowering the firm's cost of capital because the lenders get repaid in the bad states due to the bailout. Now, um, as a result, you have more investment and growth in these periods without crisis by then. The downside is you have also a higher likelihood of crises because you, you take systemic risk. But the overall effect, the weighing of these costs and benefits is positive, assuming contract enforceability is not too high. So as long as there are these borrowing constraints that matter, the overall effect is positive, And ultimately, the economy with, um, with risk taking has a higher long run growth in the economy without risk taking. Empirically, the authors uh, get to this using a measure of financial systemic risk, which is the skewness of credit growth. And the idea behind the skewness is, in a crisis, you have a large and abrupt downward jump in credit growth. And because crises are rare, uh, the distribution of credit growth will be negatively skewed. And here you have India, here you have Thailand. And, and you see Thailand was the one with the uh, boom-bust episode in, in, in lending. And therefore, you have, you have a left skewed um, distribution of credit growth here. You see also, consistent with the pictures earlier, that the mean growth of real, G, um, of real credit in Thailand is much higher than in India. Thailand was also more volatile than India, and Thailand, as I said, is negatively skewed. So in their empirical work, they basically try to understand what affects um, growth, what affects real GDP per capita growth, and what they find is that obviously higher Credit growth on average is good for GDP growth. This could be the credit deepening effect. More volatile credit growth is bad for GDP growth. This is well known. But now importantly, skewness um, affects credit growth in the sense that, that we've seen it earlier, that it means the more left skewed 
credit growth is, the higher is GDP growth, meaning this crisis risk is positively associated with long run uh, growth. And, um, and they actually do show that this skewness here captures, it could capture a lot of things, but they're careful uh, to clean it up like, so it does not capture wars or um, large terms of trade deteriorations. Good, so this is one view of the world. It's admittedly an extreme view in the sense that we can't really do much about, or we shouldn't do anything about um, the, these debt booms because the only alternative would be a, lo a lower growth path. Now, the other more uh, policy-friendly view um, is that you know maybe we can separate these um, credit booms from um, from credit deepening, and and, and this is a study um, I want to discuss a little bit. It's by some IMF researchers based on 170 countries. I'm sure many of the audience are aware of this study. And, and they do something very similar to what Emil is doing. They uh, define a boom episode as a deviation of credit to GDP from trend. Um, Emil has 1.6, four times the standard deviation. They use 1.5 times the standard deviation. So the, the idea is, 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 is very similar. They find 176 boom episodes. Um, the median credit boom lasts three years. During this time, credit to GDP grows at 13% per year, which is about five times the growth in non-boom years. Now, um, in their study, 32% of these booms are followed by a financial banking crisis within three years. 62% are followed by below-trend real GDP growth, which is similar to what Emil was showing. Um, are these high or low numbers? It depends on whether you want to see the glass half empty or half full. 30% um, of credit booms are not followed by either a bank banking crisis or low, lower long-run GDP growth. Um, so the first thing they ask is something very similar to what Emil is interested in. What is the long-run effects of a credit boom? And um, I just read this out because they, they formulated it pretty nicely. Here's so whether episodes that sharply increase credit to GDP ratio have a long-term beneficial effect depends on two factors. The first is the extent to which credit booms contribute to permanent financial deepening. Um, and this is, this is a notion that Emil said is rejected or that you would not subscribe to. And they conclude in about 40% of the episodes, credit to GDP seems to shift permanently to a new higher equilibrium level. In fact, there's a positive correlation with long-term financial deepening and the cumulated credit growth that occurred during boom episodes. The second is then the extent to which financial deepening resulting from a sharp increase in credit is equivalent to deepening uh, achieved through a slow gradual growth. And here they conclude that there is a positive correlation in the data between the number of years a country has undergone a credit boom and the cumulative real GDP per capita growth achieved since 1970. So this is consistent broadly with this trade-off view uh, that there is this, this positive correlation between credit booms and associated crises on the one hand, <coughs> but also higher growth. Now, um, the next question is if, if we think these credit booms are separable from credit deepening, what can we do about it? Um, should we do something about it? And what can we do about it? And, and so they also talk about, you know, when do these credit booms happen? And in the, about 30% of the cases, they happen in association with financial liberalizations that actually, whose purpose is to foster financial deepening, but then they ended up in a rapid credit growth. Searches in capital inflows after capital account liberalizations are another contributing factor. And then very often, strong economic growth is a predictor of credit booms. So often credit booms follow strong economic growth, which is effectively a demand side story, I think. Um, how do you predict these good versus bad credit booms in real time? It's not just about predicting credit boom in real time, because if policy wants to do something about it, you want to predict the bad ones and separate them from the good ones, right? And so here they don't have very much to say because it's really hard to predict these in real time. They, they conclude that larger and longer booms and those that start at the higher level of credit to GDP, they're more likely to end up badly. Um, asset prices are, are a predictor of credit booms, but they're not a predictor that allow us to separate good from bad credit booms. So they find that when, when they look at equity prices, in general, they grow at about 11% per year during these booms, but the 11% is the same for good and bad booms. So they don't allow us to separate the good and the bad booms. At least this is what these researchers conclude. And when we talk about policy, I, I, I cannot do, I mean, we could have a whole discussion about, um, about policy here. Uh, so let me just briefly do this on my last two slides. Um, 
they look at monetary policy, fiscal policy, and macro. Pro, and their conclusion is that for monetary policy, the problem is many times credit booms are associated with very quiet macro conditions. So then tighter monetary policy would do more harm than good. Um, also, in open economies, obviously, when you uh, tighten monetary policy and raise the rate, then you have capital inflows, which will undo the effect of tighter monetary policy. Overall, they find relatively little empirical evidence that monetary policy can uh, lower the incidence of these credit booms. Fiscal policy is rather ineffective in their view, uh, mainly because there's a significant time lag, and then there's political economy um, considerations. In the data, they find it actually has the wrong sign, and this could be mainly reverse causality. Lastly, macroprudential policies is probably, um, according to many, the most serious policy tool that we have to tackle, the most promising that we have to tackle credit booms. So um, generally, the idea is that one is smoothen financial credit cycles and to prevent systemic crises and, and cushions against the adverse effects if the crisis occurs. Um, they're targeted, unlike monetary or fiscal policy, which of course also makes them susceptible to, to political lobbying and circumvention because they're targeted policy. So the three um, that they discuss is, is, I mean, one we've seen in, in an Oscar's presentation earlier on capital requirements. They find actually the same result as, as Oscar um, presented. Basically, the uh, capital requirements um, have little success in reducing the incidence of these credit booms. But when these credit booms occur, they're beneficial because you, know, you, you have build up buffers that allow um, that, that allow banks to, to, to weather these storms um, better. And then uh, credit growth limits. These are speed limits on the, on the speed which with credit can grow. And they have some success, they argue. But the problem, with, like with many of these targeted tools, is whenever you impose a regulation restrictions, there are ways of getting around it. And, and as we all know, I mean, when lending by banks was curtailed, uh, non-banks, shadow banks, or whatever we want to call it, came in and they filled the void. And, 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 and so just some success. Then, then lastly, LTV, or debt to income requirements, um, they're potentially effective, but there's relatively little empirical evidence they conclude. So let, let me finish. Um, it's a nice piece. Obviously, I expected no less from Emil. Um, Emil takes a fairly strong stand, maybe a little too strong that credit booms can be separate from credit deepening. So the alternative is maybe um, we have to choose between two different growth paths. And, but if that is true, then I think we want a little, maybe know a little bit more about the implications for policy, like how can we predict these credit booms in real time? Um, how can we separate good from bad booms in real time? And then you know, talk a little bit more about policy. I think one of the, the, the deeper points uh, raised by this Rancière and Tornell work is sort of a, a broader question, which is you can really choose between two economic systems, uh, one in which you don't have much credit deepening, and you, you're never going to get credit booms, uh, but you're going to be on a slower kind of growth path. And you know, if you can choose that kind of without liberalizing your, your financial sector, without opening up your capital account, or you can choose kind of this other uh, world in which you're going to have some booms and busts, but your trend uh, uh, is going to be is, is going to be higher. I think I, I think that's a very very kind of uh, you know interesting and kind of provocative way to think about it. I don't actually have an answer for whether that's true or not, whether, whether countries should choose one path uh, or the other, or whether there's something in between. I think I'm making a, a kind of a slightly more modest claim, which is that within these credit booms that happen in these countries that are liberalized, these credit booms don't seem to operate in like the way that the Rancière Tornell model or most models would predict they would affect the, the real economy, which is that sometimes you take on a lot of risk to invest in some projects that turn out not to be productive. And because they're not productive and you have some type of financial accelerator, then that leads to a crash. These are really other types of booms. They're more kind of demand type uh, booms. And in, in, in that sense, um, in that sense, I, I think of them as kind of different, different animals. They're operating through uh, different channels. And I think that all, also does provide a little bit of help for policymakers in real time in understanding good booms versus bad booms. Essentially, what I'm saying is that most of these booms, on average, there are more bad booms than good booms. But of course, there are some good, good booms as well. And one way to separate them is to look at these different measures, like the real exchange rate, 
like the non-tradable relative to uh, tradable employment and output share in order to see whether you're having these, these kind of uh, 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 distortive effects that are leading to reallocation uh, toward the non-traded sector, toward construction that tend to be more likely to be associated with busts. Like, for example, you know, uh, Karsten's work showed, uh, but also this work by Kalansis that shows that you know, financial crises tend to be preceded, for example, by increases in non-tradable relative to tradable type, uh, type activity. So, uh, I think that's you know that's kind of a, a great broader question um, that I'm actually thinking about and struggling a little bit with myself in terms of what broader regulatory regime do you want to be in. Um, so let me yes. leave that a little bit, and then happy to take questions. I just have a question on the interpretation of those so-called response functions because if I take them very literally, the way you presented them, so there is a credit boom at time zero, yeah. which causes GDP growth to be positive at t minus five. Yeah. So that. You know, that's that's when it's dated. So that's the peak. Right. Yeah. I mean, another, I think, maybe more sensible way to think about this is that there are some economic expansions. You know, some of them, you know, may have a lot of expansion in credit and some of them may not, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, the ones that have a lot of expansion in credit lead to a more severe recession, which we already know from the work of Rogo from Reinhardt and, and many other people. I, I, I really have a bit of an objection just from a purely econometric and also just, you know, common sense macro perspective as sort of thinking that a credit boom at time T is causing GDP growth at time T minus five. And that might just just need to help me with this interpretation yeah. because I don't see it. And then, um, and, and so, and then the other thing, how robust is this to your definition of credit boom? Because of course there's this threshold and you haven't had yeah. time to show us, but I'm just wondering, you know, how that would hold up to different definitions, yeah. particularly stringent definitions of the credit boom. Yeah, so two, two questions uh, there. The first one is, kind of just very basic in terms of the timing. Time zero is just when you date the peak. No, no, I if understand. You, if, you show, if you look at the average over time, it starts about five years before. Maybe a better way to do it, which is kind of what we, what we did uh, in our QJE paper, was kind of looking at you know, the structural VARs, trying to find episodes of increases in credit supply that lead to credit booms, like periods when credit spreads tend to be low, for example, and then tracing kind of the full boom and bust in credit, in real GDP, uh, to to kind of these uh, uh, these underlying shocks, uh, instead of you know defining these events um, in in this way. You're you're right also on the point of you know you have underlying positive productivity shocks do also lead to credit expansion, but these episodes actually are often much more gradual than these very rapid credit booms that I think just in the data seem to be much more driven by this broad umbrella term that you know I'm calling and many others are calling credit supply, which is sort of an increased willingness uh, to, to lend kind of forgiven characteristics uh, of risk that you see, for example, uh, in credit threat measures, in credit composition me measures uh, as, as well. So that's kind of why I think about those as different from sort of periods uh, when you have kind of good economic developments that lead to kind of more gradual credit growth. But the, on the credit uh, composition well. side, we have uh, at this point some very mixed evidence, particularly for the most recent boom. Uh, I, I don't doubt the fact, I mean, I'm not questioning the evidence on spreads, but yeah. you know, so, so, so yeah. in that sense, I mean, robustness to how you define a boom, uh, and, and, you know, would be. Sure, yeah, and no, and I, yeah. I, I, absolutely, and I mean, I think there's yeah, there's lots of different ways to do it. You can vary these you know, thresholds. You can estimate VARs. Uh, you can look at you know, you look at look at these things in, in other ways. And I think most people who looked at these data tend to find the same thing, um, especially with the growth slowdowns. But the longer run level point, that's a that's a more contentious uh, point that I'm kind of putting out there to think about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, First of all, I think Holger makes an interesting point and could have used China instead of Thailand. Yes. It's the you know most profound example. Then I would have to do my picture myself, so I just copied the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would make a couple of comments. I think the heart and the soul of a crisis is as much the overcapacity being created, the physical overcapacity being created, as it is the credit. Uh, it's too many buildings are being built or too many houses or too many railroads in the in the 1800s, and, and to that extent, you know, the couple of the um, presentations, including yours, had the question, "What precipitates reversal?" Well, what precipitates reserves, reversal is the realization that there aren't enough tenants for the building, and then what precipitates the lower growth after the fact is we can't build any more buildings or houses for five or ten years, 
until demand catches up with supply. The one last comment I'll make, you know, uh, your, your comment about credit deepening is an important comment. And, you know, it, it strikes me as profound that absent calamity, debt, private debt, but overall debt, always outgrows GDP. It always outgrows GDP. And folks cite that, as you pointed out, as evidence of a maturing and uh, progressing economy. I think that's true to a point. I think it's a two-edged sword. I think there's a point at which that's too high, but that you can't observe a single country or society where that growth does not continue. So to me, that's, I think, the dilemma of our age is that debt to GDP will continue to grow, and it has a stultifying, uh, a, a regressive effect after it hits a certain point. On the first point, just about overcapacity, I think, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the factors that leads to kind of losses on, on these loans that precipitate, precipitates the reversal. And there's lots of work that sort of tries to separate, for example, the role of overcapacity, which has one kind of very clear policy implication that you should basically go destroy a bunch of houses or, or, or railroads uh, from kind of, uh, you know, having too much uh, debt or having an undercapitalized banking sector, which has quite different policy, implica uh, policy implications. And I think, you know, I would actually say overcapacity is a impossible to achieve without debt. Yes. So uh, do you take into account fiscal policy, different type, types of fiscal policy after the boom? Like, because, I mean, I guess that in the past, uh, governments tried to balance the budget, which is cyclical, and in other cases, uh, it was expansionary. So that obviously is an independent variable that has an effect of growth. I wonder if you've uh, looked at that, considered. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's a good question. I think it's come up actually two or three times in, in this conference. So Holger mentioned the paper, uh, the IMF paper that showed that if there's more fiscal space, then you know, the government can actually cushion the crisis more. Uh, the Romer, so Romer and Romer have a recent paper looking at the aftermath of banking crises, and they argue if you have more fiscal space, then you can smooth out the crisis more, you can you know, deal with your banks, you can deal with your debt problems, you can stimulate. So I think that that makes uh, makes a lot of sense, and, and, and we can look at that, or I can look at that in this context uh, uh, as well, yeah. But you know, preserving fiscal space during good times is, I think, uh, there's a lot of evidence that that helps kind of cushion the, the recession when, when it comes. Actually, in fact, you know, that the crisis uh, affected it doesn't grow as fast after the boom. Maybe because there's a contraction in fiscal policy, too. That's just yeah. that effect if the government tries to balance it out. Yeah.